name is Norman Sequera. Uh, I'm a director with the Cloud Solution Architect team in Microsoft. I lead a team of Cloud Solution Architects and engineers who are focused on helping our customers build great solutions in Azure. Uh, today, I'd like to take about 40 minutes to walk you through uh, Open Service Mesh, the why, what, how. Uh, at the end of it, I hope I'll leave you with some understanding of as to what, the, what Microsoft's Open Service Mesh offering is all about. Uh, that said, let's start off with the agenda. So here are some of the topics that we'll cover as a part of this particular session. Uh, we will try and understand what is a service mesh all about? Uh, what, what are the primary components that actually go into a service mesh? Uh, what is a service mesh interface? Uh, then we'll try and understand Microsoft offering in this particular space, which is open service mesh. Uh, we will then try and walk through uh, the steps that it takes to actually set up an open service mesh uh, for your Kubernetes cluster, and we'll delve a bit into the roadmap. So first, let's start off with uh, what is a service mesh? Uh, with the proliferation of microservices, uh, there was something that was actually required to be able to support uh, service to service communication in a secure fashion. So one key thing about service mesh out here is that it actually started off uh, or is pretty much a network infrastructure component, uh, and it's not really an application specific component. The idea was to actually have a component that would sit outside the application and take care of uh, key aspects uh, like uh, service to service level security, monitoring, uh, traffic routing. So all of these components were to be done outside of the application, right? So I think the key takeaway out here is think about uh, service mesh more as a networking service mesh or an infrastructure component that actually provides these capabilities and abstracts uh, the application developer from actually building these capabilities as a part of their overall solution. So what does the overall service mesh architecture look like? Uh, so, so one key aspect out here is obviously if you're trying to build something which actually monitors service to service communication, you would need some sort of proxy component that actually goes and sits alongside your application, right? So that's that's the sidecar pattern that is implemented by most service meshes. Uh, we will see as to how uh, the service mesh platform actually uses a sidecar to be able to actually inspect the traffic that's actually going on between the services, right? So if you look at some of the key capabilities that uh, a service mesh will actually offer you, uh, routing between services, uh, it, let's say uh, you want to control who is able to actually access your uh, services. You're, you need to be able to control the ingress. You need to be able to control the egress. You need to define certain traffic routing and splitting patterns. Uh, so let's say you actually want to do a split of 50-50 between uh, multiple versions of your services that you might actually set up, right? A service mesh will come in handy for you to be able to do that. So overall, uh, yeah, as I told you about as to what a service mesh is all about, but what are the key considerations that uh, you should look at uh, while evaluating and selecting a service mesh platform? So the first thing really is, do you really need a service mesh, right? Uh, if the application that you're developing is, is a pretty small scale application, uh, then you should definitely inspect and check if you really need to go down the service mesh route, right? So, so, so do that. I mean, if it's a small scale application, you may be able to get by without having a service mesh implementation. Uh, do you need a service mesh that actually spans clusters? Uh, all the service mesh offerings uh, that are in the space today have different capabilities and especially if you need something that actually spans multiple Kubernetes clusters at a time, not all service meshes may actually offer that capability. So try when you when you make the decision on which service mesh to go for, uh, this should be one of the key criteria that you should factor in as a, as a part of your selection process. Uh, another key aspect would be, uh, let's say when you're looking at service to service uh, communication and actually having a service mesh control that, do you need a mesh that actually just works with Kubernetes or does it span other forms of compute like virtual machines, right? Uh, do you need a service mesh that actually supports Windows containers, right? Uh, let's say your deployment happens to be on, on Kubernetes clusters, which, which are based on Windows. Uh, then what is a service mesh offering that can actually come in handy for you? Do you need commercial support? 
uh, right, uh, by the provider itself. So you may need to evaluate that criteria in case uh, in, in your service mesh selection process. Uh, one key aspect, obviously, is in terms of what are the overheads of actually operating a service mesh, right? Yes, a service mesh does give you all the capabilities, but just by virtue of having, uh, a, a, let's say, an inspection pattern in the middle, uh, you are bound to actually have a bit of, a, a, let's say, an impact from a performance perspective. So, so try and factor that in, right? So what are the overheads? Try and understand that. Do you want your policies to be enforced uh, transparently? Uh, which is what the service mesh, the networking service mesh does, or do you want the developers to actually build in and work with a lot of mesh-like capabilities as a part of the application development process itself, right? In which case your decision process might actually lead you uh, towards maybe a dapper sort of implementation instead of uh, a service mesh. Uh, let's try and get uh, a broad understanding of the service mesh uh, landscape. Uh, I, I think one of the most full featured, uh, uh, let's say complex, but extensible uh, offerings out there that can actually span multiple clusters uh, would be something like Istio, right? Uh, if you're looking at something uh, relatively lightweight, uh, Linkerd, uh, it has less features as compared to the other platforms, but uh, that's something that you could actually look at. Uh, if you're looking at uh, a mesh that actually spans multiple forms of compute, as we discussed, right? Virtual machines, uh, 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 virtual machines, uh, Kubernetes clusters, uh, CNCF governance, uh, then you might want to look at uh, console connect. Uh, and then we will talk about the open service mesh offering, right? So, so you do have a plethora of service mesh options and, and you may want to pick uh, one based on uh, the capability that we just discussed. Uh, so let's try and first understand what is a service mesh uh, interface. Uh, so one key aspect is with the number of service meshes that are actually uh, being developed. Uh, I think it was key that there was a standard spec that, that people could actually stick to. Uh, so a service mesh interface is a spec for a standard uh, or another specific spec for a standard interface for service meshes and Kubernetes. Uh, these, this, the, the SMI interface can actually be installed on Kubernetes uh, using Kubernetes uh, custom resource definitions and extension APIs. Uh, the idea behind having an SMI interface is to provide a basic set of features for most of the common use cases, especially if you're looking at, let's say, uh, NTLS, uh, if you're looking at traffic routing, then those uh, features have been defined as a part of the service mesh interface itself, right? Uh, now, the key aspect out here is why do I need a service mesh interface, right? Uh, think about it akin to, let's say, the way we have uh, components like ingress uh, as a part of our Kubernetes definitions. Uh, the key aspect is uh, the ingress itself can be implemented by multiple options like maybe an application gateway or, or Nginx, HA proxy, and so on. Uh, so, the, so, so similarly out here too, uh, you could actually look at having a service mesh interface uh, based implementation, right? So your tooling, your ecosystem could just talk using the SMI interface and the underlying services can actually be provided by any one of these service meshes that are actually implementing the, uh, the SMI interface. Uh, today, the service mesh interface does cover the basic set of use cases uh, and we do expect the interface itself to uh, kind of encompass and include more and more capabilities as we go along, right? But today we do have, let's say the most key aspects of a service mesh uh, being covered as part of the SMI interface. Uh, let's understand some of those capabilities in a bit more detail. Uh, yeah, so key aspects that you'd associate with a service mesh, uh, traffic policy and access controls. Uh, you want to be able to restrict uh, which parts can communicate with each, each other, uh, which parts are accessible. Uh, you want to ensure that service-to-service -service communication is, is encrypted and, and secure. Uh, you want to pick up telemetry uh, uh, from your services, right? Uh, metrics, uh, what is the kind of latency between the services? You want to pick up that information. Uh, you also want to be able to do, let's say, shift and, and let's say route traffic between different services. And, and, and let's say from a progressive delivery scenario, you may want to look at, uh, do I want to go on the canary route, the blue green or the AP route, uh, right? And uh, we'll see as to how some of the traffic management capabilities are part of the SMI uh, interface. Uh, so this is what 
uh, the implementation looks like uh, in the context of SMI, right? The the apps, uh, the tooling, the ecosystem, uh, all of these are actually talking to the SMI interface, and uh, the SMI interface by virtue of and and there are SMI providers in this case or adapters. Uh, which are being implemented by multiple service mesh platforms today, right? So the key thing out here is uh, your, your tooling can still talk to a common interface and that can get implemented by different service meshes. So, so the key aspect out here is uh, you're not tied to any specific service mesh implementation, right? But you still get uh, all, all, the, all the features and you can actually have scripts that can, uh, where your uh, service mesh uh, implementations can actually be swapped out. Uh, so today we do have a multitude of service meshes uh, which actually support the, the SMI interface uh, and this number is increasing. Uh, so we do have the most common ones like uh, the MySource Open Service Mesh, Linkerd, uh, all, all of these actually support the, uh, the SMI interface. We'll see as to one aspect uh, or let's say one implementation where uh, the, the SMI concept really comes in handy, right? Uh, Folks use Flagger uh, as a progressive delivery operator for Kubernetes, right? So in case you actually want to uh, implement some sort of uh, canary deployments, right? Where uh, you actually have uh, a secondary deployment uh, where you will actually route a bit of the traffic and, and, and then once you've tested it out, you actually then uh, want to, let's say, swap out. Uh, or you want to do A-B testing from a certain feature uh, test perspective, or you want to do blue green as to where you have separate parallel deployments and you can actually test everything and then swap the environments out. Uh, Flagger helps you do that, right? And, and Flagger by virtue of integrating with the SMI interface uh, can actually leverage any of the service meshes that support SMI to be able to provide you that capability, right? So Flagger is a great implementation of as to how or, or a great example of as to how uh, implementing an SMI interface uh, can actually come in handy for some of the implementations. Uh, so let's now try and understand uh, what an open service mesh is all about, right? Uh, so this is Microsoft's implementation of uh, the service mesh that we uh, discussed so far. So, so let's try and understand some of the key attributes of uh, open service mesh. Uh, so OSM is a lightweight uh, and an extensible cloud native service mesh. Uh, this is based on the Envoy proxy, uh, right? Uh, the CNCF project there. Uh, it implements SMI. Uh, it was created by Microsoft and it was donated to uh, CNCF about a couple of years back. Uh, so, what are some of the key features uh, that are offered by the Open Service Mesh? Uh, it does offer traffic shifting. So, if you want to split traffic across multiple implementations of service, you can do that. Uh, key aspect in terms of actually having uh, secure service to service, service traffic using MTLS, uh, it supports that. Uh, it also supports external certificate management solutions. So we'll talk through some of the certificate management solutions that uh, the Open uh, OSM uh, integrates with. Uh, again, one, one key aspect that we discussed so far from a service mesh perspective was in terms of actually getting observability and metrics for your services. Uh, so we'll see as to how uh, the open service mesh implementation actually offers support for observability, tracing, metrics. Uh, and all of this actually works by injecting a sidecar uh, into your deployments, right? So we'll see as to how uh, the features are actually uh, work out there. Right, so if you look at the open service mesh features here, uh, so the first component, if I just go and let's say from uh, left to right here in this case. And so uh, the first thing in this case is let's say the ingress traffic policies. Uh, so you would want to control, uh, let's say what sort of, what can or who can access the services that are deployed. Now this is an example of let's say the services that are deployed, or this is one of the sample applications that we actually have up on the OSM website. And I, and I urge everybody to go ahead and uh, try this out. Uh, so this particular implementation comprises of multiple services. Uh, uh, just to give you a quick walkthrough, uh, let's say there is a book buyer service, which is the legit service that that should be allowed to go ahead and actually talk to uh, the bookstore service uh, and, and actually buy books. Uh, the book thief is a service that should not be allowed to do that. I should not be allowed to go and talk to the bookstore service. Uh, the bookstore service then talks to the book uh, warehouse, uh, which is could be a database implementation. 
uh, and, and then there is egress out. And so that's, let's say, the flow path for uh, one of the sample applications that we have as a part of the Open Service Mesh uh, on the Open Service Mesh website. Uh, so what are the OSM features here, right? So first, as I discussed, was in terms of the ingress traffic policies uh, to be able to control uh, which one of your services is actually accessible over ingress. Uh, this point two out here indicates the fact that there is automatic sidecar injection of the Envoy proxy. Uh, the minute you configure a particular namespace as being monitored by OSM, uh, we will have the Envoy proxy injected uh, automatically. So let's the book buyer, the book thief, uh, the book store, and book warehouse. All of these namespaces are being monitored by OSM, and hence we have the Envoy proxy injected into those uh, uh, nodes. Uh, the and obviously this by because of the fact that we actually injected the uh, the proxy there, uh, they are the ones responsible for actually looking at what sort of traffic policy has been applied. Uh, uh, whether it could be a uh, routing uh, or, or whether it could be uh, from, let's say, access perspective itself, right? So that's what the automatic sidecar uh, does there. Uh, if you look at point three out here, uh, the scenario that I was talking to about was in terms of uh, allowing the book buyer to talk to bookstore, but not the book thief, right? Uh, so that is where you have service to service level access control. Uh, and then let's say point four is in terms of, let's say if you have two versions of the bookstore service, uh, right? So you may actually want to do, uh, let's say progressive delivery. You may want to switch from bookstore one to bookstore V2 using any of the methods that we discussed earlier. So that traffic splitting is done by open service mesh. Uh, and again, uh, controlling in terms of from an egress perspective, right? As to when there is outbound communication, you may also want to control there in terms of uh, who is allowed to talk uh, outside and not. And point six out there are the observability uh, capabilities that we spoke about, right? Uh, to be able to track the metrics reported by uh, the services, you want to trace your service to service loyal communication and access the logs, right? So all the key capabilities that we discussed so far as part of service mesh are actually covered by uh, open service mesh. Right, so let's try and understand as to uh, how that is the implementation of OSM itself, right? Uh, so here what happens in this case is uh, we do have a proxy control plane. Uh, the proxy control plane is the one that's actually responsible for going ahead and talk, uh, talking to uh, the proxy, uh, the, the sidecars that are actually being inj injected. Uh, this communication happens uh, again over a secure channel over a MTLS, and, and this communication is required for you to be able to actually, let's say, flow down your config, your policies uh, from the proxy control plane to the actual proxies that are sitting on these nodes. Uh, what you also have is a certificate manager. Uh, obviously, this is uh, which actually helps you provide uh, MTLS between your service to service, uh, and as I said, uh, you can actually have multiple and um, different certificate components actually being leveraged here. Uh, the endpoints provided out here uh, helps you, uh, let's say, communicate with different kinds of platforms. Right? As we said, the uh, as I said, the OSM is actually available on multiple platforms. It's available on uh, AKS, uh, which is a managed uh, uh, Kubernetes offering. It can also be installed on any Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, so the endpoints provider actually helps you manage based on the endpoint that's, that you're finally going to be talking to. Uh, the mesh specification is the one that actually takes up all of these components out here uh, that you see in the service mesh controller, uh, packages into a structure that can actually be relayed back to the Envoy uh, and for that for that information to be configured on the, uh, the Envoy itself, right? Using the Envoy itself. Yeah, so in terms of, let's say, MTLS support, uh, we do have mutual TLS for port to port encryption. Uh, we do have uh, the version 1.0 released uh, some, uh, a little bit earlier this year. Uh, so we do have support uh, for, uh, let's say, OSS upstream. Uh, if you install OSM yourself on the Kubernetes cluster, uh, it's supported along with AKS2. Uh, the mechanism, as we discussed, is by using a sidecar, which is on one in this case. Uh, we uh, it, it works at layer seven. Uh, that's how we actually get uh, HTTP-based uh, access control. Uh, you have access control policies, as we discussed, in terms of uh, blocking service to service level communication. And the installation methods will actually change uh, based on where you're looking at installing the open service mesh. Right? So in the next couple of slides, I'll actually go through in a bit more detail in terms of uh, how the open service mesh deployment would actually vary based on whether you're going for 
uh, OSM uh, as an OSM on uh, on, a, on your own Kubernetes cluster or on AKS. So uh, one of the key considerations that we discussed earlier at the start of the session was in terms of what is the overhead uh, that the introduction of a sidecar of, of a proxy uh, is going to cause, right? So uh, what is it, what does it mean from a resource consumption perspective and a latency perspective? Uh, so the numbers that I've pulled in here are from a, a set of load tests that were done with along with Istio. Uh, I, I think the mesh in this case was about uh, 1,000 odd services, 2,000 sidecars, uh, and about 70,000 mesh-wide requests per second. Uh, so based on based on the tests that were run, uh, this uh, this is what the summary information looks like, right? So in terms of adding latency, is about 2.65 milliseconds. Uh, that's what uh, the proxy adds. Uh, and in terms of memory consumption and CPU consumption, is about 0.35 eCPUs and and 40 megs uh, per about 1,000 RPS, right? So, uh, so be mindful of this one. This may not really impact in most of these cases uh, in most of your uh, scenarios, but uh, you should definitely consider this uh, uh, the, the impact while designing your solutions. So what we've done for the open service mesh is obviously uh, there are a, a lot of components that we deploy as a part of the open service mesh installation itself. And what we've done out here is for the pods that are actually installed uh, to support OSN, we have specified uh, certain default limits uh, for CPU and memory. Uh, these are documented on the OSM website. I suggest you have a look at it. I've just pulled in the latest uh, uh, default configuration and, and it's pretty much the same as what it was sometime back that hasn't changed but this also gives you a sense of what is what are the resource consumption what's the resource consumption for the components that are actually installed as a part of the OSM installation process itself okay now let's focus on uh, managed open service mesh right uh, so if you are looking at Kubernetes clusters which are up on Azure uh, or if you're looking at Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes uh, we do have the option of actually getting a, a managed OSM in there. Uh, the managed open service mesh is, is fully managed and supported by Microsoft. Uh, and these, and you can actually install the managed version of open service mesh by uh, a, an add-on on AKS. Uh, and at the same time, there's an extension that you can actually do for Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes. Uh, both of these components, uh, as in uh, for both impl the implementations for both Azure Kubernetes Service and Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, they are both GA. Uh, and, and you can actually look at the talks online on the website uh, for some more information on these components. Uh, so let's try and understand uh, the OSM differences when you're looking at uh, the managed version, right? So the first column out here is, uh, is the managed version, which is uh, going to be running on, let's say, AKS or Arc enabled Kubernetes, uh, which would be running, as I said, by the, the, the AKS add on method. Uh, or the other scenario is where you actually look at installing OSM. Uh, uh, you can do a self install on any Kubernetes cluster that you're running, right? And this could be outside of the Azure Arc managed uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so for the ARC components or for the AKS components, um, the you can install OSM very easily by just going and actually enabling an add-on. Uh, I can just show you as to how that's done on the, the portal, uh, as well as as to how we can do that while using uh, CLI, right? Uh, whereas in case of the self-installed uh, option, you need to actually maybe install the, the OSM CLI uh, and then I go run some OSM commands to actually install OSM on your uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one difference out here is in terms of the, OS, the OSM components. Uh, in case of the AKS and the Arc enabled Kubernetes, they get installed to the cube system in space. Uh, whereas in case of the, uh, let's say the OSM self-install option, yeah, they actually get installed to the OSM system in space. Uh, shouldn't really impact, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you are, if you've written some scripting around it, uh, right, you may want to, uh, let's say, query the right namespaces to get your information. Uh, the managed OSM versions, which are actually running, uh, which which work with AKS and Arc enabled Kubernetes, are fully supported by Microsoft, and you can actually raise an Azure support ticket in case you see any challenges there. Uh, for the community supported, uh, in case of let's say the OSM self-installed version, the support is from the community, and you will have to go down the GitHub issues route uh, to raise an issue and uh, and uh, rely on the community to actually support you uh, uh, in case you have a challenge. 
there is no OSM dashboard in case of the uh, the managed uh, version, whereas there is one in the case of the self-installed version. Uh, in terms of features and capabilities, uh, all of the capabilities that we spoke about, which is in terms of uh, MDLS, uh, traffic routing, uh, right? So all, all the access policies, the split policies, observability, uh, all these capabilities are available in, in both deployments, the managed OSM1 or the self-installed version 2. Uh, in case of the managed version, we do have, let's say, a self-signed CA with stressor. Uh, whereas in case of the OSM, the self-installed version, you do have the option of actually going down the route of, uh, and you do have the option of different uh, certificate managers. So uh, before we just do a walkthrough, uh, so uh, a quick sense, right, as we have spoke about, do you really need a service mesh, right? Uh, we, we have Dapper in this space too. Uh, uh, and and let, let's try and understand uh, what are the primary differences and, and when would you go for Dapper or when would you go for OSM or can, can you actually look at going for both, right? Uh, so if you look at this particular diagram out here, the capabilities definitely uh, do have an overlap, right? Uh, and if you look at the overlap, that's primarily from, let's say, uh, the secure service-to-service -service communication, which is MTLS. Uh, the observability part, uh, right? Uh, the, the tracing, all of these capabilities are part of the OSM as well as Dapper, right? So OSM has additional capabilities in terms of the traffic routing and splitting, uh, whereas in case of Dapper, those are not natively, but you may actually work along with an ingress controller to do that. But I think one key aspect that you need to actually uh, consider out here is that uh, Dapper is not a service mesh, right? Uh, uh, the OSM is a proper networking service mesh that we actually have here. Uh, Dapper was meant to help provide building blocks uh, to make it easier for applicators, to developers to build applications uh, as microservices, right? So uh, think about develop, uh, Dapper as being more dev focused, uh, right? And, and OSM as being more infrastructure uh, focused uh, networking component, right? Uh, do both coexist? The answer is absolutely yes, right? But uh, uh, if you end up using both together uh, for some of the capabilities, do ensure that the common capabilities are not turned on twice, right? Uh, so, so in case you're actually using uh, Dapper along with AS OSM, ensure that you use the MTLS uh, encryption capabilities of only one of those components and not both at the same time. So let's uh, start off with a walkthrough uh, on setting up OSM uh, on, on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so for the sake of this walkthrough, uh, consider the same demo scenario that I spoke to you about. Uh, this is a sample application that's available um, on the Open Service Mesh website. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to actually set up this bookstore sample application uh, uh, while that template is given there. So uh, let me just set up the application for you. Um, so uh, there is a book by a service. Uh, we and there's a book thief service, uh, and both of these services currently are, are capable of actually talking to the bookstore service, and the bookstore service finally ends up talking to the book warehouse, which is which let's say could be talking to your uh, database components. So. Uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, you could have all of these services being deployed, right? Uh, but from an application perspective, uh, uh, it's, it's critical that only the book buyer service is allowed to talk to the bookstore, and the bookstore is the only service that's allowed to talk to the book warehouse, right? Uh, you want to prevent the book thief service from talking to the bookstore service. Uh, let's take that as our objectives and see as to how we can actually go about implementing that using OSM. Right. Uh, so let me just walk you through the steps here. Right. So for setting this up, the first thing that you need to do is uh, the walkthrough here that I have here uh, is uh, I've gone down the route of actually using the managed OSM offering. Right. And when because I had a Kubernetes cluster on Azure and make this cluster in place, I've actually gone down the route of setting up uh, the managed OSM offering on the AKS cluster. And as discussed earlier, the option to do that on AKS is by just enabling the add-on, right? So key thing as compared to other service mesh offerings is, is that you don't need to really set up the entire infra that's required for the service mesh itself. Uh, what you can do here is just by specifying that you actually want to enable uh, the add-on for open service mesh, uh, the installation configuration process will actually go through and it will deploy 
uh, the relevant board, uh, the relevant the, the relevant parts, uh, uh, the proxy control plane, uh, and, and so on. Right. So let's let's ha let's have a look at the uh, steps here. So it'll take you about a few minutes uh, when you actually run this particular step. Uh, but once that's done, uh, and if you actually uh, browse through all of the parts that are actually set up, you will see, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of them being set up. As I said, uh, the ones that we get installed as a part of uh, the add-on route, uh, these particular parts will actually go and sit in the cube system namespace, right? Unlike in the, if you go for the OSM on your own Kubernetes cluster, uh, it'll actually go into the OSM system namespace, right? But here I've just filtered through, uh, let's say the parts that I've got installed, and and we have the uh, the OSM injector, the OSM controller parts that I've actually got created, right? And all of those have been these the specified default limits for memory, CPU, etc., have been applied to these particular uh, parts. Uh, it'll take you a few minutes, uh, but, but yeah, once that's done, uh, you should be able. You should have an. The, the OSM setup should be up. You can actually then go ahead and check up on the Azure portal, and it will show you that the OSM configuration is done there. Right? I've gone the CLI route, but you could have very easily done this via the Azure portal too. Uh, so what are the next steps, right? Uh, it's We need to tell OSM uh, about the namespaces that it needs to monitor, right? So what we did for this particular sample application is, uh, first thing that we did is we created multiple namespaces. So uh, we went ahead and created namespaces for the book buyer, the book thief, the bookstore, and the book warehouse, right? So once these namespaces were created, uh, we then went and told uh, the, OS, uh, the OSM controller components to go ahead and actually monitor these namespaces. Uh, so so you, you just do that by just saying OSM namespace add, and you, you specify a list of all the namespaces that you actually want to add here, right? Uh, one key thing out here, though, is that uh, yeah, so this so you will actually get a message saying all of the names. This is added to uh, OSM, and the same thing will get reflected on the Azure portal too. Uh, I, I didn't blow this screenshot up too much, but uh, the minute you do this via the CLI, you will see uh, in the OSM interface on the Azure portal that all of these names this are now actually being monitored by uh, OSM, right? Uh, so so what happens? So so what we've done so far out here is we've enabled the add-on. Uh, we've created we deployed a sample application uh, uh, across namespaces. Uh, we then told the OSM to actually go and monitor specific namespaces. Right uh, now, by default, when this uh, when you actually get OSM configured, uh, it does not block traffic by default. Right, so so if you actually had an application running. Uh, and you went ahead and uh, installed OSM, it does not mean that your current traffic will actually stop, uh, right? And your application will still still be working at the end of the day, right? So that's the default uh, deployment option for OSM. Uh, now, when I actually go ahead and open up, let's say the uh, books, the book thief website or the book buyer website in this case, both of these services are actually constantly polling and making a service call to bookstore, right? Uh, so, so, so what happens is if I just take the default setup deployment of OSM, you can actually see as to what's happening here in this case is uh, the book thief service is working, right? Uh, the, you can actually see the counter continuously incrementing. The same stuff happens with the book buyer service. So both of them are be able to talk to bookstore. And the key thing here is both of them are actually talking to the bookstore V1. We've just deployed the bookstore V1 so far, right? Uh, so key thing is all traffic, Goes through properly enough, uh, right? And then OSM is still not doing anything from an, an access policy perspective. Uh, so the next thing that we'll actually do is go ahead and look at from a traffic access perspective, right? So uh, I, I do have this YAML here in this case, and what we're trying to do here out here right now, if you look at it, we have uh, the bookstore service, and we specified as a part of this particular access policy that only the book buyer service can go ahead and actually access the bookstore service. Now, it's it's very easy to apply this particular access policy, so I've just gone ahead, uh, taken the sample policy, uh, and I've applied this to the, uh, to the uh, cluster. Uh, so once this happens, uh, what, what, what we effectively have done is we've ensured that all calls to bookstore are only from the book buyer service and not from the book thief service, right? So consequently, what's going to happen is uh, the websites that I have, uh, the book buyer service is still going to be uh, able to go ahead and actually pull the bookstore service and be able to get response back, whereas the book thief service is not able to call the, the bookstore service anymore and effectively 
uh, the number of books stolen, where that number still stays stuck at that particular point in time, right? So, so implementing a simple access policy about controlling which service can access which service uh, was, was very easy to implement using the YAML itself, right? Uh, pretty straightforward implementation. Uh, so what we also did was uh, just to show you uh, from an MDLS perspective, right? Uh, one of the key capabilities that we've been talking about is the service to the service level uh, encryption and security. Uh, so, so once, let's say, we uh, do have uh, the OSM in the picture and I have MTLS going in place, uh, I've just picked up, uh, let's say, a Wireshark capture. And if you look at this Wireshark capture, you will see that there is service to service, to service level communication, which is locked down by MTLS, right? So we can always run Wireshark between those two IP addresses assigned to the spots. You can, you can actually see uh, that the traffic are going between those two particular services is actually uh, locked down. Uh, so yeah, so we looked at uh, the traffic access perspective. We looked at MTLS. Uh, now let's look at uh, traffic splitting here in this case, right? Uh, so what we've done to the same sample application right now is we've deployed, uh, let's say, two versions of the bookstore application, right? A bookstore V1 and a V2. And I said, you can obviously make this as a much more complex implementation by using Flagger, et cetera. But here with basic uh, service mesh itself, uh, what we've done is we want to now get a, a traffic split in there, right? So this is what we are keen to do here in this case. We want to route maybe X person of traffic to bookstore V1 and Y person to bookstore V2. Uh, so all you need to do is, is have a YAML in place. Uh, you can actually specify in there uh, what is the split routing uh, that you're looking at, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, the YAML out here is, uh, talks about 5050. Uh, take this particular YAML, apply to your uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster, and, and at the end of it, you will actually see uh, the split happening. So there now, if you actually look at bookstore V1 and V2, you will start, start seeing calls going to both, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bookstore V1 and V2 there. Uh, the other thing that you can actually do is from also what you've done out here is for the managed OSM versions, we've integrated that with Azure Monitor too. Uh, uh, so on Azure Monitor, we have something called an Azure Monitor Container Insights, which can actually give you insights about your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so what you've done right now is we integrated OSM monitoring also as a part of Azure Monitor Container Insights. It's in preview right now, uh, but the key thing that it actually allows you to do is uh, you can actually filter and view inventory of all the services that are part of your service mesh. You can visualize and monitor requests uh, that are going across services in the service mesh uh, with what is the request latency, uh, what are the, what's the error rate, uh, what does the resource utilization look like, uh, and, and it provides an overall connection summary for, let's say, the entire OSM infra that's running on, on AKS, right? So this, this monitor integration is one key aspect that's been done, done along with the managed OSM deployment on AKS. So yeah, uh, because it's a part of the Azure Monitor, you can uh, then go and actually use uh, KQL and, and start querying uh, the the monitor logs. Uh, if you want to pull up uh, some metric information, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, you can also implement uh, Jaeger-based uh, tracing, right? So you can actually go and do that too. Uh, you can also go and integrate with uh, Prometheus and Grafana, right? So if you want to do some metric scraping uh, for the OSM, you can actually go and uh, do that along with Prometheus. Uh, so what we've looked at so far is, uh, is how is it how can you actually go ahead and install the managed OSM offering on AKS? Um, you have the implementation, as I said, on your own uh, Kubernetes cluster is is very similar. Uh, you the deployment will differ a bit. You will go the Helm chart route, or you will go the uh, OSM CLI uh, and installation route there, right? So. But at the end of the day, all the steps that we showed in terms of, let's say, being able to do a traffic access split, a traffic access policy and a traffic split, uh, those, uh, those concepts stay exactly the same. Uh, let's let's look at the roadmap uh, down the line. So we did uh, get uh, OSM v1 uh, released a bit earlier in the year. There is v1.1 that's out right now, uh, and, and there's work that's happening on v1.2 and 1.3. Uh, the roadmap is public, and you can actually go ahead and look at the public roadmap on the URL that I provided here. We do have information displayed in terms of which are the ones in backlog, which are the ones targeted for the future, uh, which are the bugs that we're working on currently. Some of the key upcoming features that we are working on uh, are in terms of actually providing Windows container support, um, and let's say some of the Azure specific integrations, right? The same Azure monitor integration that I showed you, which is in preview. We're looking at getting that into GA. 
uh, and we're looking at uh, getting a bit more integration going with some of the ingress controller components, right? So we do have an AGIC on, on AKS implementation, the application gateway ingress controller. We're looking at integrating that as a part of the OSM uh, capabilities itself. Uh, next, uh, yeah. So if you look at the same GitHub site, uh, you or the open service mesh slash OSM, uh, you can then go to the issues. Uh, you can then group all the capabilities on milestone. You will get a good sense of uh, what's what's coming uh, down the line from a capabilities perspective. So currently, uh, these are some of the key ones that are pulled out for the V future, uh, right? So the the dates for this is not logged down, but you will see some of the capabilities that we uh, we are looking for. Uh, are, are being targeted as well. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this session. Um, so uh, thanks for taking time out. Um, and yeah, I'm still open for questions. So in case you have any questions, please uh, feel free to post them up in the chat. Uh, we will take those questions and, and answer them as best as we can. Uh, again, thank you very much for taking uh, time out for the session and have a great, uh, uh, let's say, enjoy the rest of the sessions.